All right, I want to watch this. This is called How League of Legends Conquered the World. Nick was an American high school student living on the island of Guam. Growing up on an island is a bit of a double-edged sword in many regards. Islands can be paradise with beautiful landscapes, but sometimes bored high schoolers just want something to do. For Nick, that something ended up being playing computer games. Real-time strategy games were hugely popular during the time and had caught Nick's attention. He had been playing games like Homeworld and StarCraft religiously to a point where he was starting- The man knows he's shit. The man knows he's shit. We just watched the monthly recap of games coming out next month. There is some cool shit coming out. Of course there is. I mean, we are entering sort of like the, the time of year when all the good games come out. We just exited the, the drought phase. Although the game that I'm most looking forward to is Plague's Tale Innocence. Uh, it's a GBA video. He made pretty good vids back in the day. What video? You want superhuman soldiers? You want tanks? You want bigger tanks? You want a missile launcher that's designed to level cities? Then come on down to the Imperium of Man. Nice. <laughs> um, Alright, maybe to give some backstory here. I am a huge League of Legends fan. Uh, used to play it for about six years, way back in the day. I haven't played it, though, for a long time. Nowadays, I literally just watch... The Ali C. I'm a huge esports Ali C fan. Uh, Misfits represent Fnatic Misfits this weekend. Not sure who I'm supposed to support because they're both my teams and they're playing each other. And the one who loses is out. They don't go to Worlds. They're literally playing each other for a spot at Worlds, which is sad as fuck. But anyways, um, so yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of League of Legends, and of course we have the League of Legends Riot MMO coming up which is going to be huge as well. So, yeah, let's see how League of Legends conquered the world. Starting to learn how to mod the games himself. StarCraft in particular had a pretty detailed map editor included in its main expansion, which allowed players to create their own custom maps and modded versions of the game they could then share with others across the internet. This really caught Nick's attention. And before long, he was creating and publishing his own games to the web. Shortly after that, Nick began to develop a small following who enjoyed paying attention to his games, eagerly awaiting his next release. He would make dozens of games over the course of a number huh. of years, but his magnum opus came out in 2001. It was called Eon of Strife. Dude, if this turns out that League of Legends was once again first made on like a Blizzard title, Blizzard is going to fucking kick themselves. Because <laughs> Dota was made in Warcraft, right? The original Warcraft uh, like map, map editor made Dota, which Blizzard didn't give a fuck about. When the, the people who made Dota, when they sort of went to Blizzard and they were like, hey, do you want to buy this? Blizzard was like, nah, never mind. And then eventually Valve was the company that picked up Dota and made a Dota 2, and that's where Dota was born. And now it turns out League of Legends may actually have had its start in StarCraft. It's like, oh, for the love of fuck. <laughs> like, Blizzard, both the, like, the biggest MOBA games on the planet both had their start in Blizzard games, and Blizzard cannot pull off making a fucking MOBA. You know, when they did Warcraft 3 Reforged, they withheld ownership of any game made in the world editor. <laughs> exactly, Tuck. Maybe because of this, right? They were like, fuck it. The community keeps making better games than what we do. We won't let them have any games. If anyone makes a game with our map editor, it's ours. We have the game. It's our game. The basic idea behind Eon of Strife was a team of four players were tasked with fighting in a war between two armies while only being able to control one character each. This all took place on a specialized battlefield that featured two bases, one on each okay. side of the map with four lanes connecting them. 
Every few minutes, minion units would spawn from each base and run down the lanes until they met the opposing army and began fighting. Dude, literally. The for the players. Literally, the dude fucking made. <laughs> the dude made League of Legends in StarCraft. Blizzard just can't catch a break, bro. <laughs> was to fight alongside their hordes of minions, oh, eventually pushing back the enemy forces, making it to the enemy base, and destroying it. All of this was originally played against a computer that had slightly stronger units than the players did, which is where the challenge came in. The four teammates would have to work together helping each lane that fell behind before the enemy team overran their base. The one thing players had going for them, though, was their champions would be slightly stronger than the average. I didn't even think of that, chat. This is actually, yeah, I didn't even think of that. This guy may actually have made, like, the original MOBA. The grandfather of all things MOBA. Because, yeah, Dota came from Warcraft 3. StarCraft 1 launched a lot sooner or earlier than Warcraft 3. Motherfucker, yeah, Blizzard hates their life, bro. Minion, as players got they to could have owned to play as this. one of six unique heroes. These heroes had special stats and abilities, and any time they got a killing blow on an enemy minion, they would be granted a bit of currency they could later use to upgrade their character. Yep. It was a fun little map that caught enough attention online that fans were still thinking of it when Blizzard released their next game. In 2002, Warcraft 3 debuted, which was a game that looked almost suspiciously like Eon of Strife. Although it was another traditional real-time strategy game released from Blizzard <laughs> Entertainment with the normal base building and army management always included, Warcraft 3 introduced a new idea to the genre, heroes. Players were now given unique characters that had special abilities and could fight a- Wait, so Blizzard did steal that idea from him, but they never thought to themselves, hey, you know what? Maybe this could work alongside their hordes of minions in battle. It didn't take long for old Eon huh. of Strife fans to notice the similarities, and soon many were recreating their mod in Warcraft 3. One of those fans was a kid named Kyle Summer, better known online by his username Yule, who called his version Defense of the Ancients, or simply Dota. His version of Dota was a little bit different from classic Eon of Strife in that it was now mm -hmm. played on a three lane map and included five players on each team. Dota yep. also expanded on the roster of playable heroes by a very wide margin as it was now easy for fans to take basic Warcraft 3 characters and import them into their own mod. Shortly after, Warcraft 3 would have its own expansion released, coupled with another highly detailed map editor. Seeing the potential for the game to grow, Kyle made a really selfless decision to release his game's source code so anyone could copy and build their own version of Dota. Soon, dozens of Dota variants, each with unique heroes and items, were being made in- Did you know what's interesting? Back then, things were so new. Do you think this would happen today? Do you think if someone made a map editor game today that was really successful, they would just release the source code? Absolutely not. They would be like instantly, oh my god, oh my god, I have the next big fucking game. Let's go. Um, back then, people were just doing this for fun. Like, this guy was having so much fun. He was like, okay, I'm going to make the source code public and see what other people can come up with. Let's see how cool this could be because I want fun games to play. Let's see if other people can make this even more fun. That passion is gone from the gaming industry, man. Just completely gone. And shared all across the internet until two friends had an idea. A couple of Dota players who went by the names Mian and Ragnar gathered all of the best heroes they found in all the variants of Dota across the web and created a single mod that included all of them called Dota All-Stars. In 2004, the mod really began picking up steam when it made its way to the University of Wisconsin. There, a young student named Steve Feek, who went by the online username Ginsu, picked up All-Stars and began patching it. 
Ginsu originally began fiddling around with the game because he wanted to fix some of the bugs he kept running into when he was playing games with his old college buddies, but before long, he was releasing regular versions of it with even more changes to make the game more fun. He was adding item trees for players to further Jesus. customize their characters, as well as adding a boss monster to the map named after his bowling ball, but the most significant change was Ginsu thought this genre of game might be more fun if instead of fighting waves of AI minions, players instead fought each other. That was the change that blew ah. Dota up into the mainstream. Of course. Oh, holy shit, dude. 61 million fucking views, bro. <laughs> Difficult to describe what made the game so fun, but by 2005, Dota was huh. becoming a worldwide success. At Blizzard's first ever annual BlizzCon event, they hosted a Dota tournament, even though it was all for a game they didn't even make. The fact that Dota found so much success while being nothing more than a custom map in another person's game was remarkable, but it didn't take long for the game's limitations to begin showing. Because every Dota match had to be run through a Warcraft 3 custom lobby, the game would never be able to have independent features, like a matchmaking service, ranked ladder, or punishment system for players who abandoned games. If this new genre was ever gonna have uh -huh. those features, it would have to become a standalone title. And in 2006, someone had the idea to make exactly that. Dota fanatics Brandon Beck and Mark Merrill founded Riot Games that year, and shortly after went around hiring many original Dota creators, including Ginsu, to develop their own game. That game Dude, that's it, right? That that is it. Uh just take the inspiration, make your own company, GG. Game known today as League of Legends would prove to be everything the original mod couldn't be growing past all previous limitations. League of Legends had a long and trying development it had to go through before ever seeing the light of day. Most of the developers working on the game were nothing more than fans of a custom Warcraft map with very little professional game design experience beyond that. When it came to building their own game engine and early prototypes, there were always loads of problems they were running into, which eventually led to Jesus, a that's a lot of fucking sticky notes, bro. <laughs> Similarly, Riot had a bit of a conundrum they had to answer in what their game would actually be. Ooh, While they certainly knew they were making a Dota style game with a three lane map, players choosing characters and customizing their play style through items and role choices, same as ever, there was always a question of whether or not certain things should be changed. Many original Dota elements were things the UI that were was simply <laughs> left over from the Warcraft 3 engine, like the day night cycle, slow turn ratios, and an ability to kill your own minions. Riot would go on to remove all of these elements, much to the chagrin of Dota. Die Dude, this must have been, like, even prior to Season 1, right? Because I don't remember, and I played the game on, like, when it first came out, and I don't remember ever seeing this UI. So this must have been, like, early day UI. Very early day UI. Although I will say this, just something that I find incredibly interesting... It's kind of the same way World of Warcraft started. You know, yes, uh, Mike Morheim uh, did study game design, but Blizzard was a company founded by gamers. It was people that just, they were nerds that loved playing video games and wanted to make video games. That's it. That's all they cared about. You know, they hired people back in the day, people like Terran Gregory, who had little knowledge outside of knowing how to use OBS and making like sort of editing movies. They hired people like Ian Azicostas, who was a lawyer at the time, but just really loved writing um, to start making raids for them. It was a company that it was far more important back in the day that you had passion for gaming than it was that you went to college. And I want to say it shows. Because these days, if you wanted to go, like, literally go to any gaming company right now and apply for a job there. If you don't have at least a degree in game design or coding or some shit like that, you won't even get a foot in the door. Like, they will legit just not fucking hire you. 
They need you to have that useless fucking degree on your wall. And it shows. Because the games that we get these days is nowhere near as impactful. I'm not going to say that they're not as good. Because there are really good games that still come out every single year. But if we're talking about genre-defining games, like, for example, Warcraft and Starcraft, like World of Warcraft, like MOBAs, like League of Legends, these were genre-defining. These were games that pushed gaming into a whole new direction that people didn't even know at the time they wanted. These days, you get a lot of companies that do what everyone else has done before them, right? So... Everyone sort of makes a copy of everyone else. They make the graphics look a little bit different and the playstyle maybe a little bit different. But for the most part, it is the same game that everyone else is playing. Very few companies these days can actually push it forward and actually define what the genre is supposed to be outside of your indie companies, which again goes back to that a lot of indie companies are founded by a group of friends or one guy that just has a passion for making some video games. That's it. And it is so fucking glaringly obvious. Walker 3 and Dota get their ideas from this. Nixty, I'll check it out in a second. Juggernaut, how you doing, bro? Uh, Japan never stopped making gems, in my opinion. Waste some indies aside. Stagnated, though. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say that... It's just... I genuinely don't know, right? I'm not a huge, like, Japanese game follower. I, I don't really play a lot of Japanese games outside of Final Fantasy XIV. I've... Uh, actually, I, I don't think I've ever played a, a Japanese game outside of Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, unless you want to count Tomb Raider, which is made by Square Enix, but it's made, I think, by their Montreal studios, so it's not actually a Japanese game. Um, so I, I can't really comment on that. But no, I do, outside of that, I'm going to say it's clear that the West have become far more business first. So the West doesn't look at gaming as a passion, as, as, as an art. It looks at it as a business and you want to make money, as much money as possible. Tasty, you bastard. Thank you so much for the Prime Sub. Did really appreciate that. Two months in the D-Gen army. Thank you, thank you, thank you, bro. Uh... Dark Souls, played a little bit of Dark Souls, love Elden Ring though. So, yes, okay. Let's say Elden Ring, that is also a, you know, Asian Japanese studio. Um, wait, is from software Japanese? I think it's Japanese, right? But that it, that's not really the game that comes to mind when you think Asian games. Um, so yeah, I, okay, Homeless Dude, yeah. Okay, I can I can agree with you there. Uh, there are definitely a lot of good games that comes out of Japan these days. The West does have its gems, but it is fewer and far further between. Mainly because it's all about the money nowadays. As soon as you come up with any idea uh, for a game, the first question that almost every single company in the West asks is, uh, what cash shop can we put in here and how much money can we make here? That's it. That's what they want to know. And usually that also means, well, fuck you, there's not going to be much of a game. ...iHards, but they believe doing so would streamline the experience, creating faster gameplay that was easier to understand and felt more responsive to play. Oh, dude, I remember this. You guys, I don't know, I know that's not what this is actually about, but this is SKT T1 Faker. Faker, for a long time, was considered to be the best mid laner in the world. Look at his health, right? Look at the other guy's health, Rio. And look at what this guy does. I hope he shows the whole clip here because fuck me, this was OP. Many of these quality of life oh my God, is, retro. He actually ends up killing the guy. Um, it, it, it was so fucking good. I remember that clip really well, but he does end up killing Rio. Respect were probably a pretty good idea, but one evening, Riot took things a bit too far. At some point during development, Riot made the decision to make their main game mode a 6 versus 6 experience rather than the traditional 5 versus 5 Dota had always been. They were probably thinking the number of players- Lost right, so you do have a point there. And it's one of the reasons I believe that the AAA gaming industry will have its inevitable end at some point. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me instantly here, but I believe that within the next decade to two decades, uh, AAA gaming is going to die. 
AAA gaming, to my mind, is very similar to mainstream media. Back in the day, if you wanted to be able to speak to the world, you needed a media company, right? You needed massive cameras, massive budgets, massive sets, massive lights, and you needed some way to broadcast that message to the world, and then other people needed televisions and all that shit. That's over. I'm sitting here in my room with an internet connection, camera, and I'm talking to you guys. And all over Twitch, there are average human beings having discussions with people around the world, independent of uh, the mainstream media. Mainstream media is dying, and I view the AAA gaming industry as a similar thing. It used to be important. Why? Because back in the day, the only way for people to play your game was to buy it on a disc. Those discs would cost money. If you want to print a, a disc, you need the money to buy the, the raw materials to actually get the discs. Then you need the money to actually print all that, that code on that disc. You need packaging, you need shipping, you need marketing, because obviously all of this just costs money. You need to market to make sure it's getting sold. So you needed a, a shit ton of money just to make some money off of your games. Nowadays, it is fucking simple. It is simple. You have Steam. You post your game on Steam. It's easy as that. It's done. You don't need a production company. You don't need a publishing company. You just need a game, a good idea. And if you're really fucking hard up for it, so if you don't have any cash to do any sort of advertisement, just go to a couple of streamers. Like, legit. You can literally email a couple of streamers and be like, hey, I just made this game. I want to send you a key. If you would try it out, maybe try it on stream. Just see what you think of it. I, I'd love to get some feedback. And a lot of streamers would probably be like, yeah, all right, no problem, man. I, I, I'll give it a go. Let's see how it goes. Steam is going to be the death of the AAA industry. Because Steam is to the AAA industry what YouTube and Twitch is to mainstream media, in my opinion. AAA studios won't die. They are morphing into something else. They won't make games for you and me anymore. Only mobile style games because the market for those is a lot bigger than the market for PC and console games. And the consume customers are far less demanding. That's right, but that's a pivot from them, right? That still is the death of AAA gaming. Because if they pivot, and I think you are right, we see it, Blizzard is already going balls to the wall in mobile uh, with so many mobile offerings in the pipeline. That's literally one of the reasons why Microsoft is buying Activision Blizzard is because of all of the mobile games that they have in the pipeline. So we are seeing more and more of these companies diving into the mobile market, but that still is technically the death of AAA gaming because if they're going to make games for mobile, I'm not going to play those, right? I'm going to get my games from the indie developers because fuck them. Um, and I do think the mobile market is going to catch up as well. Mobile, currently, as far as I'm concerned, is where PC used to be back in the day, um, where you could basically come up with any fucking game and there's going to be an audience for it. But as that audience also matures and sort of grow up, they're going to start demanding better games, which is then going to mean that more and more people are going to dive into the, like the mobile development space. More and more indie companies are going to dive into the mobile development space. And eventually the AAA companies will just become obsolete. Why? Because they're too big. For a, a AAA gaming company to make money, they have to sell millions of copies and they need a cash shop in order to get all the money. For a an indie company to make money, if they get 100,000, 200,000 copies sold, they've made money. You know, they, they've made good cash just from selling a couple of hundred thousand copies because they only have like maybe five or six developers that they need to pay. And that's good money. You know, $20, 200, 300,000 copies. That's a decent chunk of fucking cash. <clears throat> More room for PC games, true. I've not been listening for the past 10 minutes, but I agree. Andy, go fuck yourself. We don't need you to agree, bro. Uh, we also run into issues of larger companies have too many people monetizing what can and can't be done in games. So instead of things being raw and brilliant, it's mostly shul. Nick Steve, very fucking true. 
players per team had changed before, and maybe this could improve the experience further. In interviews as late as April of 2009, just months before release, Riot was promoting League as a game specifically with 6v6 gameplay. But sometime in the following months, mm -hmm. this change would be reverted, and it's not hard to guess why. The Dota genre may have small details that could be improved upon with added or removed mechanics, but the overall structure of the formula was perfect. Five players per team just kind of worked for whatever reason, and increasing or decreasing that number made the experience way less fun. Riot would then go mm -hmm. on to release League of Legends later that year as a 5 vs 5 experience and stayed away from making any other fundamental- Dude, I'm gonna be honest with you. I did not even know that you could buy League of Legends discs. Did you guys know that? Danish, how you doing, bro? First time I bought, like, first time I got League of Legends, I downloaded it. <laughs> it was, it, it was just a download. I didn't even know that this th this shit existed. <laughs> me. I'm assuming that it it's not the game that you're buying. You're probably buying some kind of skin or maybe like a gift card for a skin or something because the game has always been free to play. Unless, of course, this was the collector's edition um, and that is what they charged for, right? Speedy, how you doing? played two rounds of lol and was like i don't like it not for me oh league of legends is so much fun though until changes to the game the release of league marked the birth of this new genre that would eventually be dubbed the moba in its early era league was a pretty rough buggy mess due to many of the hiccups that riot kept running into during jesus but even so wait did alistar wait did alistar just yeet that guy off the fucking map Look at, look at Grass here, right? Just getting yeeted off the fucking map. Look at this. Be rough, buggy mess due to many of the hiccups that Ryan kept running into Jesus. during the development. But even so, the gameplay proved to be fun enough that it garnered a small community. Uh, <laughs> NGT, how you doing, bro? Can you watch The Emperor had a text-to-speech program? Uh, thanks for the first time chat, by the way. And no, uh, I'm not going to watch that yet because we tried to watch that about two weeks ago. And a lot of the jokes in the text-to-speech stuff is um, inside jokes that you kind of need to know the lore for in order to understand the jokes. And a lot of that was just sort of like completely over my head. We were literally just sitting here going, oh, okay, I guess. I, I have no idea what the fuck this means. So I would first need to know a little bit more about the lore uh, before I think I can, I can watch something like the, the text-to-speech stuff. Now that the wider world had finally been exposed to this new genre of game that up until now had only been reserved to custom- Dude, Freak? That's Freak, by the way. Freak was with this company from the beginning. League for me is like gay sex. It's only acceptable if it's with friends. Despair? Speedy? I'm not sure I follow the logic. Yeah, I, I would I would say that is like a take on steroids. I would argue that if you are so inclined to have gay sex, maybe not having it with friends is probably the better option. Because having it with friends might like really sour the relationship eventually. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna knock you. You, you have to take. You're gonna have to wear that one. But I would say, I don't follow it. Friends don't judge you. I think friends would judge you a little, though. Especially if you want the sex and your friend maybe doesn't. You might get some judgment there. Having sex with friends isn't gay. They're friends. Are we redefining what the word gay means now? Because I'm pretty... Wait, 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 wait. What the fuck are you guys saying? Because if you're saying gay sex, yeah, 
That is two dudes bumming each other in the asshole. That's gay sex. It doesn't matter if you're friends or not. If you and your friend both have a dick and you decide to have sex, that would be gay. That's lesbian sex, Evan Raven. Let's not get our fucking streams crossed here, right? That is gay sex. It doesn't fucking matter if, if it's your friend. Oh, it's not gay if it's with your friends. Get fucked, bro. That's like saying it's not gay if the balls don't touch. Of course it's still gay. There's two sets of balls there. There should just be one if you want to have straight sex. If you want to have gay sex, great. But then two sets of balls would make it gay sex. So proud of disrupting the whole react with this message. <laughs> uh, Bang my jeans for years and never heard anything. <laughs> Jesus. I'm going to be transphobic. How am I being transphobic? What about anything I just said is transphobic? I'm so straight, I can suck a dick. It would not be gay. Nyara, you and I, I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna have to have a discussion about what so straight means. Map making communities, they thought it was pretty fun too. Soon, League of Legends began Book of all, how you doing, brother? becoming one of the most popular online games there were, as well as the biggest competitive esport on the planet, and other gaming companies took notice. A number From of the titans and... of the gaming Jesus, industry that, to tell- That is fucking not what I said, Cortex. That is not what I said. You can't go well. <coughs> okay, so it was me and two of my friends. We had three sets of balls there. Wasn't gay. If you and both of your friends are male- that makes it gay. It might be little gay, but it's still gay, right? Um, being homophobic is gay in its core. We're thinking about what other dudes do with their dicks. Dude, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> if one isn't gay, but two is, then it follows that three is not gay. Your logic is flawed as fuck. Because if it's just one... Well, actually... Being just one could still be gay. Because if you're getting yourself off, but you're thinking about someone of the same sex, then that is pretty gay, bro. Even if it is just one, that is still pretty gay. If you're thinking about someone of the opposite sex, that wouldn't be gay, right? <clears throat> Little gay versus big gay. That is a thing. That is a thing, I think. So I would say, for example, if you are a guy and you're engaged in a devil's three-way, <coughs> that would be little gay. If you are a guy and you're in a threesome with two other guys, that would probably be big gay. Right? Um, yeah, I, I think little gay for devil's three-way and big gay for just three-way with three guys. One equals not gay, two equals gay, therefore three not gay. Dude, I literally just explained why one could also be gay, though. Self sex is sex with the same sex, so we are all gay. Oof. That logic, though. So what if you're banging a chick with a dick, but you're thinking about banging your bro? Well, in the one sense, you would not be gay, right? But then if you're thinking about your bro, little gay, though. Because the same would then apply. What if you're banging a, a, a chick with a vagina? Well, that doesn't make you gay. But if you're banging your girlfriend that has a vagina, but you're thinking about your friend that has a dick, little gay. Not big gay, because you are still banging a girl. But little gay, because whilst banging the girl, you are thinking, oof, I really wish that my bro was here instead. Little gay, I would say. Think you are gay? How could it be incest though, Nixty? We are not related, are we? Is that even possible? I don't know if it's possible. Someone just fucking brought up. No, there wouldn't be a medium gay. Definitely wouldn't be a medium gay. What if you think about yourself? Is it gay or self cest No, you can think about yourself. I think that's fine. I don't think having sex with a trans girl is gay. 
So for me, that would be the same as just having sex with any girl. Yeah, I don't think that's gay. The reason I don't think that's gay is, and I realize there's some people that do think this, right? I realize there are people that think, no, no, if it's a trans girl, it's still gay because it used to be a guy. But here's what I would counter with. Is it then straight to have sex with a, with a trans man? Say Buck Angel, for example. If anyone's ever seen Buck Angel, the dude is like a fucking dude. If the logic is that having sex with a trans girl is gay, then it means having sex with Buck Angel is straight. If you are a straight guy, you would not be able to get it up for Buck Angel. Like, fuck that, would you? You wouldn't be able to. So by the logic itself would dictate there that one is gay and the other one isn't gay. <clears throat> yeah, fucking Buck Angel would be gay. The dude is a dude, right? Uh, so no, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I, I think if, you know, if you, if you fuck a girl that has a dick, that's still straight. But if you fuck a girl with a dick and you think about your bro, mega gay. I uh, know, little gay. Could be mega gay though. How were you thinking about your friend? Buck equals auto gay? Dude, yeah, Buck Angel would be super gay though. Fucking Buck Angel, is Ala gay? Depends though. If you're a girl and you're fucking Buck Angel, straight. The deep philosophical debate of mega gay. Mega gay would be a difficult one to to grasp though. Because what what level of fucking would make you mega gay? Is they looked so miserable in the eyes before like dates there. Now, though, the eyes are alive and there is joy. That's what the whole trans thing is about. I have, I have, we have a lot of people in this community that is trans. And I love all of them because they're level-headed as fuck. Um, I don't, I don't mind people for what they want to be. If it makes you happy, be fucking happy. Do not start fucking forcing other people into bullshit. That can get me a little bit pissy. Okay, now the real question. Are fanboys gay? Y yeah, probably. I would I would argue if you're a guy and you're dating a fanboy, little gay probably. Not mega gay, because you do get fanboys that basically look like girls. But I would say little gay, borderline. Border. Let, let's say that you you're you're sort of on the fence, getting ready to dive into the fucking colored pool, right? Twinks would be gay, one hundred percent. Twinks would be gay because a twink is just like, I think, twink is what smooth shaven or some shit like that, just semi bisexual, as in straight with extra step. <laughs> Is kissing your the homies goodnight gay? Yes. I would argue yes. Um, I work with a guy that everyone was sure was gay, but nope. He he just wanted a big strong like muscle girl. Everyone is different, right? And everyone likes different things. My philosophy in life is very simple. As long as you don't fuck on my bed, I couldn't give two fucks who you fuck, Right? And probably it has to be consenting adults, right? But outside of that, I couldn't care less. I, I have more important things in my life to worry about than whoever is fucking who. And for what purpose and reason. School of Fame Boy, and oh my lord, this is some Slanesh stuff. Aeschylus, we have, uh, I think, two or three Fame Boys in the community. One of which actually, uh, like a few, I think a year ago or so, uh, people were sending pictures of themselves and we were sort of rating people in the stream and they sent, uh, like he sent a picture of himself and I kid you not, I was convinced it's a girl. I was like, all right guys, so uh, Luna just sent a picture here. Uh, what do you guys think? And everyone in chat was also like, uh, oh yeah, she's fucking cute. And then Luna was like, wait, I'm not, I'm not a girl, I'm a guy. And it's like, what? In what fucking universe? 
television shows to even Blizzard themselves, it didn't take long for everyone to start making their own MOBA game with their own characters and ideas for the genre. What is interesting though, is we are watching a video about how League of Legends conquered the world. How in the fuck did we end up on this conversation? Anyone in chat wanna hit rewind and quickly check how the fuck this happened? We were watching a video about League of Legends and somehow we're discussing gay sex. I do not understand. Oh yeah, it was Speedy Love. That's true. Yeah, Speedy, fuck you. How dare you? How dare you derail this wholesome Christian stream with your degenerate filth? MOBA still had many characteristics that the outside world saw as flaws, like the hyper-competitive community and incredibly steep learning curve. So perhaps it's no surprise so many companies jumped on the bandwagon <laughs> trying to fix the genre but with the hopes brother. of being rewarded with a Summer massive I hide payday. Bro. But what was a surprise was how many of them <laughs> failed. The decade of the 2010s was filled with MOBA releases, but virtually none of them survived. Half of all releases don't even have live servers anymore, while the other Fuck. half are supporting smaller communities than what they had at launch. League of Legends and Dota are basically the only two MOBA games that still see widespread popularity today. You can make any number of guesses for why nobody else succeeded in this space, but in my humble opinion- To be fair though, I would next year. I'm not even gonna fucking apologize for that. If you give me an option between Zeech, Nurgle, uh, Korn, and Slanesh, I am 100% joining Slanesh because, okay, sure, Slanesh is a fame boy and you're gonna get a lot of sex, but with the other one, you're gonna get your dick falling off because of some fucking plague, or you're gonna get skull fucked by corn over and over again because skulls for the skull throne and shit, or everything's just continuously gonna change and you're gonna get wrecked. In all of those universes, sex at least seems like semi fun. And I believe it's because this genre of game is kind of antithetical to traditional corporate game development. Normally, video games get made when a publisher hires a studio led by a director to create a title, all in a very controlled environment. This group mm -hmm. is trying to make something that is obviously fun, but sometimes they're thinking about things beyond that. Publishers need to keep costs down while selling as many copies as possible to turn yeah. a profit, so development teams are often given strict timelines with low pay and rough working conditions. Similarly, many design decisions have to be made with things other than fun in mind. If you want to sell as many copies as possible after all, being fun isn't the only thing that matters, you need a game that's also easy to learn, appealing to general audiences, enjoyable by all ages, and packaged with a friendly face. Um. So I would argue there's a couple of mistakes he makes here that I'm not entirely uh, on board with. So for one, it's not true that if you want to sell a lot of copies, the game has to be as easy as possible. Elden Ring proved that by being one of the top selling games of all time. And that's not an easy to learn game. It's a pretty difficult game. I think uh, the bigger issue is that this is what publishers believe to be the right way to make video games. They believe that games should be as easy as fucking possible because otherwise it would be too hard and people would be like, oh my God, I, 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 I can deal with this. I'm, I'm a moron. I, I don't know how to play. Um, that's not true. I think a lot of people love difficult games. The issue just these days is the real difficulty in gaming is finding the fucking difficult games. Um, I also don't necessarily think that games have to be pushed for all ages. I think gamers are gamers regardless of age. Uh, I've I've never heard of a game that's really popular for fort with 40-year-olds, but isn't popular with 20-year-olds, except for Fortnite. But that's only because Fortnite is only popular for fucking kindergarten kids. Um, outside of that, no one wants to play it. Uh, so I think a lot of this just boils down to you have a gaming industry that is run by publishers where the marketing team, so the teams that basically come up with what makes games sell, don't play games themselves. 
They have no idea what gamers actually want. This is why so many game. I don't know if you guys have seen <clears throat> uh, Ubisoft. Ubisoft, just uh, their new game, Skull and Bones. It's miserable. It's horrible. Like, when they announced or when they finally showed us what Skull and Bones is going to look like, I remember watching the trailer and thinking, who did... Who who did they make this for? Like, who is this game supposed to appeal to? Like, what cunt at Ubisoft said, you know what, guys, we have to make a pirate game, but we're going to make it like this. This is the pirate game that is going to sell. That's the problem. It, it is all run by marketing people that have no idea about games. They don't play games themselves. They're just in it for the money. And they do all of these studies and they go, oh my God, this is the games that people want to play. That's why when Elden Ring first came out, you had all of those developers at AAA Studios criticizing the fucking game. I don't know if you guys remember this. On Twitter, you had like uh, people from Ubisoft, people from Blizzard criticizing Elden Ring, saying how the map was a mess and the UI was a mess and the game was a mess and they didn't teach you enough and there was no tutorial for the game and that's why the game is bad and then the game outsells everything that they have made in their like in their bio it's like oh well i guess the mess is really doing well right <laughs> so a huge delay between announcement and release i believe it was announced around the time yeah it was literally supposed to come out around the same time as uh, Sea of Thieves. And all they had to do was be Sea of Thieves with better graphics and they would have fucking killed it. And instead they went, nah, screw that. We're gonna do, you're on your boat. You can't really leave your boat. You, you don't really capture other boats. You just sort of attack them and it's all just a sequence. So for example, if you do board another boat, you don't fight the boarding thing. It's just a, a cutscene where you're bored and then you win or you lose based on the cutscene. I say, wow, what a stupid fucking idea for a game. It's made for kids, yet their major buyers are ages 20 to 40. See, gamers play video games, bro. League of Legends was significant because it was the exact opposite of all of that. This was a genre built by a collective group who were just trying to make something fun and nothing else. It began with a single high schooler making a custom StarCraft map and soon got passed around like a game of telephone with loads Marvel, of voices volunteering true. their own ideas to the creative process until it grew to be larger than any one of them. Nobody was thinking about profit or deadlines. Nobody was worried if the game would be easy to learn or had a friendly community or whether it would even be finished. And yet it's it making just money. a group of hyper competitive elitist nerds trying to make something that would be fun for themselves. And they accidentally ended up creating the greatest competitive video game format of all time. At yep. a certain point, I don't think anyone could even tell you what made the game they came up with work so well. Why the five players per team? Why the three lanes? Why play all of this on a single, unsymmetrical map? Later MOBA games, including League itself, would try adding new game modes and maps to give a fresh experience for veteran players. When League was released in 2009, work, in addition though. to Summoner's Rift, it also shipped with a 3v3 two-lane map called Twisted Tree Line. Early mm -hmm. promotional material for the game marketed... I'll be honest though, I did enjoy the twisting, the twisting tree line, and I still like in League of Legends ARAM, which is all random, all mid, right? I still li like ARAM. The three, the three v three map was really fun. It wasn't competitive, but it was really fun. Um, the reason it worked, and I am, I'm a firm believer that this is the only thing that works. It works in content creation, whether you're a YouTuber or a Twitch streamer or whatever you are. This is the only thing that works. Find something that you love doing and then just do that. And then hope that you find other people that love what you do as much as you love doing it. This is one of the reasons I've changed my entire stream thing from trying to chase the meta to just doing whatever the fuck I want to do. Did I lose viewers? Yes, of course I lost viewers. 
because chasing the meta does bring you some viewers. And at some point we had well over 300 viewers, but it's not something that I wanted to keep doing. I didn't like doing that. So I said, fuck it. I'll do what I want to do. And hopefully I'll find a bunch of degenerate Fox that wants to do it too. It might not be, it might not bring in the millions, but it will continuously bring in money. It will continuously bring growth. That is the secret behind game design, in my opinion. You find a game that you love, a game that you want to play, and it's true for all of them. Warcraft. Blizzard made Warcraft because it was a game that they themselves wanted to play. Starcraft. Blizzard made Starcraft because they wanted to play. They were fans of Warhammer. They wanted to make a game for Warhammer. When they couldn't get Warhammer, they decided to go for StarCraft, but it was still the game that they wanted to play. World of Warcraft was made because they wanted to be in Azeroth. They wanted to experience what Azeroth was all about. And so they made World of Warcraft. And ultimately, it became the games that we love to this day. Make what you love and it will fucking sell. The second you start chasing the next big thing, that's when you fail. This is actually one of the reasons I think Ashes of Creation might surprise everyone. Because Ashes of, Ashes of Creation is one of the few games right now that isn't being made to chase some trend. In fact, Stephen Sharif have said multiple times, this is the MMO that he wanted to play. He's basically making an MMO for himself. And hopefully there's other people that want to play it as well. Um, <clears throat> what kind of GG and Fox would? Evans, how you doing, brother? Uh, oh my gosh, I could listen. Mortuary Assistant came out with a full game and it was amazing. And it was made by one person. There's actually a number of games that I've played that literally just one person made it. You can see by big streamers, they play and promote new games, but that is business. I mean, there is always going to be an element of business, right? No matter what you do, this is my job, so there is an element of business here. But... A month ago, the React meta was Andrew Tate. It's probably still the React meta. About three months ago, the React meta was Amber Heard. I purposefully didn't want to join the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial because I had no interest in it. Eventually, I was like, okay, fuck, I'll watch it because people kept saying, dude, we have to watch that. You have to watch that. You have to react to it. I hated it, so I only did it like two times. Uh, the Andrew Tate meta, couldn't give two fucks. I don't even know who the fucking guy is. So I don't really care. I'm not going to watch it. Even though that is the React meta right now. That's where the views lie. That's not what I'm interested in. I'll watch my fucking Warhammer stuff. I'll watch my gaming stuff because that's the stuff that I care about. If other people want to watch Andrew Tate, I'm sure there's a million streamers out there that is currently fucking watching Andrew Tate bullshit. Go watch them. Uh, I'll be here watching my gaming stuff and nerding out about new games and crap and Warhammer. I'll watch a lot of Warhammer stuff. The League is something worth playing specifically because you could play more than one map. Later still, one of the earliest major new projects Riot took on was the creation of a territory style game mode on another new map I'm happy called to hear Dominion, that time. played on the Crystal Scar. When Dominion was also fun, released, actually. They garnered a relatively positive response from fans who thought they were a fast and fun change from the regular 5v5 mode. But after a few years, both of these maps proved to be so unpopular that they were removed from the game entirely. Were in fact, they unpopular? the only though? game mode in League today, other than 5 versus 5 Summoner's Rift matches that still finds some popularity, is All Random All Mid, another community-created game mode that fans built for themselves through League yep. custom games. Yep. What makes the MOBA genre so interesting is how a community created Dude. a game that was so fun it Dude, proved to be look more at the enjoyable than anything here. every mega corporation Jesus. could put together. In fact, traditional institutions didn't even understand the genre themselves. In the early 2010s, the original Dota developers who didn't go on to work at Riot ended up getting hired by Valve to create a standalone Dota project that would eventually become Dota 2. 
As the game was being rolled out, Valve filed a trademark for the word Dota, which is a standard legal procedure for any other video game genre. But Sasha, how you doing? Created a have you watched videos Real Surgeon explaining Space Marines medical upgrades? No, I have not watched it. A nightmare legal battle in this one. At the time, Blizzard was developing their own MOBA game that was literally called Blizzard Dota. They were simply operating under the assumption that they owned the trademark and copyright for Dota since it was something created in their own games. They originally tried to stop Valve from filing the trademark, but Valve believed they had full rights since the latest yep. Dota developer, Icefrog, was working to build Dota 2 with them. Additionally, a rioter who ran one of the early Dota community sites filed a countersuit to try and stop the trademark, as he believed the community themselves owned Dota. He thought they should own the rights to the game, so Valve couldn't shut down the original mod if they wanted- Dude, this was before people even understood trademark law. <laughs> Like, everyone's just like, dude, I thought of that word first. That's my word, clearly. Fuck. Right? It's my word. I thought of it. ...to in an attempt to funnel old fans into their own release. Eventually, Valve seemed to agree to give up non-commercial use of the word Dota, ensuring the original mod's survival in exchange for the commercial rights to promote and sell their own product. But the fact uh -huh. that lawsuits were even filed and this ended up in a court shows but what happened just how... What happened to Blizzard's MOBA? You made this, I made this. Because this was before Years of the Storm came out. Long before Years of the Storm. Blizzard was working actively on their own Dota. What happened to that game? Did it just die? I mean, to be fair, I don't know much about trademark law. I do know copyright law is completely fucking broken. That I know for a fact. They make, they can't remake Dota. Well, at the time, they probably could have. We scrapped or turned into Euros. Bliss spit on Ice Frog, so Valve, Ice Frog, so Valve got, got him. Dude, Blizzard made so many small mistakes. They could have owned, they could have owned one of the largest MOBA games in history. Fuck, you must be so angry <laughs> looking at this going, God, fuck, we could have had this. This could have been ours. And all they had to do, literally the only thing they had to do was go to the original creator of Dota and just hire them. Just hire them to make the game official who do you main as one league um in league of legends i don't really have a main anymore because i don't really play anymore i i watch uh, more than i play these days but i used to main volley bear and nasa's jungle used to way back in the day strange the circumstances were around this genre's creation. It's really unlike anything else out there. Riot has since reflected on this history and coined a phrase for it, black licorice culture. See, red licorice is something everyone likes. Nobody turns down a Twizzler. But the fact that it's so ubiquitous- Um, I don't like red licorice. I don't like any licorice. What, what are you talking about? kind of makes red licorice feel not all that special. Black licorice by comparison might only be enjoyed by a fraction of people, but the people who do like black licorice really like it. League of Legends was something that was built to only appeal to a small group of people, but they loved it so much they couldn't help but force everyone else to give it a try. And of all the players who've picked up League over the years, uh -huh. there's one person that I believe represents this game better than any other. Dude, what the fuck? Dude, what the fuck? Like, how do you end a video like that? There's one person. What the? I do not comment often. Dude, that is like, oh my God. I really want to know what the fuck he says now. <laughs> Jesus. Oh my God. Um, 
I mean, it does the job, I suppose, right? It was a bit about, I don't remember the gay part. I mean, it's about League of Legends, right? But no, I would, I would argue. But I agree with everything he said here. Um, I don't think there's much that you can disagree with. But it is interesting that as video games have evolved, this is probably the issue with almost everything that goes mainstream. Um, things start off as really cool when there are sort of fringe cases, right? And in the in the fringe case, it becomes this sort of following, it becomes this cult classic. It's really awesome. And then as soon as it goes mainstream, it, it's almost as if it becomes watered down. Jen Jenna, how are you doing? Thanks for the prime sub, really appreciate that. Five months in a row. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it just becomes boring. And that's what gaming is these days. I don't know if you guys, so... I was in high school back in the 2000s, right? So I finished high school in 2003. So old as fuck, right? But when I was at school, being a gamer was really not a thing. I, I, there was no real, I'm a gamer. You would play games, but, you know, almost no one would know about it. You wouldn't really talk about it unless you had a couple of friends that would play games with you. It was just sort of like, you, you, that's something you did as a hobby. Nowadays, it's become this mainstream thing and everyone thinks it's so fucking cool. And the problem is, all of the games that come out these days, just crap. It just, it's just getting worse and worse. Just played games. Curse of the Wedgie Board. Wait, what? What is...